Thank you so much for spending your weekend with us. We are so excited to have you here. I want to kick us off with a short video, all right? Just see what you think of this. Hi, I'm Richard. This is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now, the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now, Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now, the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now, Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. Right. So I was watching you guys very closely. Who saw all four changes first time around? One person, three changes first time around. A couple of people, two changes first time around. One change first time around. Please join me in the Zero Club. I see zero every time I watch the video. So what happened? Y'all got into NYU. You're smart. You're hardworking. I was watching you guys watch this. You were attentive. You were engaged. You weren't on your phones. What happened? Just yell it out. Yeah. OK, what is selective attention? Even though they're right in front of us? Because theoretically, you were looking right at it. OK. Does that, does that resonate with anyone? Raise your hand if that sort of feels like what happened to you. That you were doing exactly what you were asked to do, which was pay attention to the card tricks. So you were doing the right thing, and yet somehow something wasn't visible. And when a different perspective, like a different camera angle, was offered to us, somehow we saw things, we noticed things that we didn't notice that first time. That's the thing that I've become so interested in. I get up in front of groups of students like you who are a little older um, than you are right now, and they are constantly pointing out to me, as young people do, things that I might not have noticed, that I assign a reading, that I've assigned for years, a classic in my field, if you will. And then a student will write me and say, I'm a little surprised you assigned such a sexist reading. You know, I get kind of indignant. How dare they? I'm an egalitarian through and through, and I start typing back my dear student, how dare you, email. And only to when I flip the pages of the article that they were observing as sexist, and I read it, and I realize, oh my gosh, this is sexist. I had normalized so many things. I grew up with so many things that I didn't even notice. I didn't even see something right in front of me until a different perspective was offered. 
I've become so interested in this moment of noticing and what happens when something becomes visible to us that wasn't visible to us before. And I, I'm reminded of a moment when I uh, took my children to Disney when they were younger, and we were going to this animation workshop. Have you ever had the opportunity to learn how to draw from a real animator? And we got to this workshop, and I'm telling you this story I should mention. Don't turn around. Promise you won't turn around. Everybody promise? My seventh grade daughter is sitting in the back of the room. Don't turn around. She's sitting in the back of the room right now as I tell this story, and she may be hearing this story for the first time. I take her and her sister to Disney. We're going to do the animation workshop. I think that I'm going to plant them in the front row of the animation workshop, and my husband and I are going to get a little bit of breathing room while they do the 40-minute workshop. Instead, I find myself in the front row of the animation workshop, and here's the problem. I can't draw, and I know I can't draw. I have 50 years of data <laughs> that proves I can't draw. And yet, what do we never say to our kids? What's the word you're not allowed to say? Can't. So I have to fake it in front of my children. I have to fake believe that I can learn how to draw, that I, for the next 40 minutes, in fact, I'm, I'm excited to learn how to draw. And I convey this fake belief to them, and they buy it. And weirdly, something funny happened when I fake believed it. I started to believe it. So I started engaging in drawing grid lines. I don't know if you can see these very light pencil grid lines. And the final product was, who is this? Olaf. I drew that. I convinced myself through my fake belief that I actually could become better with effort. And in fact, what it turned out I did, according to the research of Carol Dweck, psychologist at Stanford and her colleagues is when I activated that fake belief that I could learn something, that something was learnable and that I didn't have to be born knowing how to do it, what I was doing was switching from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And in a growth mindset, I believe that I can improve on something regardless of whether I'm starting from here or here or here. I can always get better. There's always room for progress. And what does this have to do with noticing? Well, it all has to do with what happens when you make a mistake, when you miss something. When you assign that reading in class, sure that you have assigned an appropriate reading only to be told by a student that you've missed something, that you're now noticing a mistake you've made. And in that moment, do I go into the mindset where I believe this is an area of noticing I can improve and grow in? Or do I believe I should have been born knowing how to do this right? Let's do a quick little activity, because I want to convince you in these few minutes of how hard this work is. Here's what we're going to do. If you're able to perceive color, you'll see this as green, red, purple, green, blue, and we'll, we'll go on. And what we're going to do is out loud as a group together, we're going to say these colors. OK, so I'm going to guide us through it. I'm going to go first column, second column, third column. Are you ready on three? One, two, three. Green, red, purple, green, blue, blue, yellow, blue, red, purple, green, yellow, red, purple. Awesome, keep going. <laughs> Look at you, you're not stopping. No, I love this. You guys are like, I worked so hard to get in this seat. I'm not stopping now. Getting all the way to the fake red. OK, all right, so let's break it down. What just happened for you? Who can describe in a sentence or two what that felt like mentally? Yeah. Exactly. So what was the symbol on this? So the first, this is the first slide? Green. Green. It was, it, was, it was the perception of color, which you're able to do. If you're able to perceive color, you probably do it in milliseconds. It's what we call an automatic response. And then tell us what the second thing was that happened. Then I was perceiving color green, but I was also seeing the word brown. Right. Which is a word for color. 
It's just a word for a color. So another potentially automatic process for many of us, meaning within milliseconds, you perceive these symbols as having meaning. In other words, you read. So what I did to you on that second slide was create a mental collision. These two automatic responses. The first one was the perception of color. The second was the perception of words. And now they've two, two uh, responses have collided. And what it feels like is suddenly nothing is overriding anything. You're having to sort through it. In other words, your more deliberate mental processes are having to get involved to sort through your automatic mental processes. This is so important because what some studies tell us is that at any given moment, your mind is processing 11 million pieces of information. Like, like then, right? 11 million pieces of information. Now, I know for a lot of us parents in the room, you're like, that might be lowball. It might be more than 11 million right now. If you only knew. True. But on the other hand, notice all the things that you're processing on autopilot that you don't even realize it. All the stimuli in this room, the visual stimuli, the fact that you know to look forward, the fact that you can perceive shapes, the fact that you uh, know to not to lie down right now and to sit up, all the other ideas swimming in the back of your mind, there's no conscious awareness driving all of that work. 11 million pieces of information on autopilot. 40 pieces of information being processed consciously, sitting within your awareness. You're exerting control and sort of paying attention to those thoughts. So we've got 40 and 11 million. That means that something like 99.997% of our mental work is happening back here outside of our awareness not in a way that we're necessarily noticing it. And this, again, becomes our key thing. What happens when we notice something in that 11 million that we may not have noticed before? Is it possible in those moments that we have the sort of, aha, it ain't so much the things we don't know that get us into trouble. It's the things we know that just ain't so. That here, in fact, when we notice something that we were sure was right, and then someone says it's not, when something that was visible to others but not visible to us comes into awareness, what happens? Now, in the good old days, way back, we didn't have a lot of good measures. In fact, really all we could measure was that 40, not the 11 million. So basically, we just gave people lots of surveys, like on a one to five scale, on a one to seven scale, true or false, those kind of questions. But that's only getting at the 40. It's not telling us anything about the 11 million. So in recent decades, there have been more and more sophisticated measures that try to measure our unconscious processes or our automatic thoughts. One of them some people may have heard of called the IAT or the Implicit Association Test is something that measures what's called unconscious bias. This is a free um, and anonymous measure. If you want to do it, it's on a research site. Um, that's at that URL, feel free to do this. And if you take this particular measure, what it gets you is an, a peak, just a peak, not, not a definitive, definitive uh, result that defines your identity forever, but just a peak at that moment in time on that day of what we call implicit bias. And by implicit bias, I mean when you have to operate within milliseconds, like that, just like we did with what was called the Stroop task earlier when we were looking at the colors and the words, when we're operating that quickly, what ideas are holding together in our minds? Because if I say peanut butter, you say, do you remember when you started associating peanut butter and jelly? Probably not. It's just something you've sort of breathed in through what Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum calls the smog, that in your whole life these, these ideas just were associated. Some of you did not say jelly to peanut butter because you grew up in a culture where peanut butter and jelly were not associated with each other. So while our minds are set up to have 11 million and 40 autopilot and less autopilot, that's how our brains are wired. The actual content of the shortcuts we use to manage that 11 million thoughts on autopilot, that's shaped by cultural influences. Some studies show that by the age of five or six, our implicit race bias, so in other words, the associations we have between white people and qualities like being smart or dumb or safe or dangerous, and black people, those associations look like the adults in our culture by the time we're five or six. 
Can we reflect on ways in which we might be a holder of implicit bias? What studies show is that all of us have some implicit bias on some topic. It may vary. Yours may be different than mine, race, gender, sexual orientation, physical ability, skin tone, religion. I love the quote that if you think you have no blind spots, that's your blind spot. <laughs> that in fact, what we're wanting to look for is not proving that we don't have these implicit associations, but considering the ways in which we might notice them more actively. And what are the ways in which we may be targets of implicit biases? Many of us believe and we're taught that good people are free of biases and mistakes. That in fact, if we were raised right by people in this room, we should know how to do this already. I'm on a campaign to undo that. I want you to let go of being good people. Why? Because it's a super tight corner with no window. There's no room for growth there. Is it a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? It's a fixed mindset. Because if you should already know how to do this, then there's no room to get better at it. What if we thought of ourselves as goodish people? Goodish people who are always learning and getting better, owning our mistakes, in fact, looking for our mistakes, knowing we're going to make them, and taking ownership for when they happen. Goodish people are actually becoming better people every day. One of the pleasures I had in working on my book was I got to step out of my social psychologist, researcher, academic role and be a little bit of an amateur journalist and interview lots of people in the real world so we could weave together real world stories with the science. These are just some of the many people who um, were gracious enough to be interviewed for the book. Jody Pico, the best-selling author, Tommy Kale, director of Hamilton. But I want to tell you my favorite story, which is about Joe McNeil. He's in the bottom left corner. And my guess is many of you wouldn't recognize him there, but you might recognize him here. So you may remember what this picture, these pictures are of? Yell it up. The sit-ins. These are the lunch counter sit-ins. This is known, these four young men are known as the Greensboro Four. In 1960, they started the lunch counter sit-in movement that spread across the country would lead to thousands and thousands of people sitting in in segregated spaces. This is Joe McNeil here. This is Joe McNeil there. He's been gracious to come and join us as a guest speaker here at NYU a number of years. The first time he came, he got up in front of my students and gave beautiful remarks, inspiring, humble. Like, if you're picturing a big flashy guy, no, like really low key, a lot of dad jokes. Like, yeah, the nicest man. And we get to the Q&A period, and um, the students are, are so respectful and interested in asking him great questions. One student gets up and says, General McNeil, thank you so much for your courage and service, sir. What are your thoughts on gay rights? Joe stumbled. He stumbled badly. And in front of everybody, it was clear he was living in a different time. So I was like, OK, let's keep it moving. Next question, where's our microphone? And we kept it going. I didn't have the guts to say anything to him. He's a civil rights hero. I invited him back the next year. He came back. We once again did the same format. He gave an inspiring set of remarks, sharing this experience and what had happened since. But then to my surprise, there was some new material in there. And in there, he was saying, he's been talking to younger people in his family, family lately, lately. He's been watching news stories differently. He's been interested in learning more about gay rights, because this is something he knows he has to become more educated about. This is a blind spot he's had. Wow. Later, I would interview him for my book. And finally, I get the guts to say to this man, this giant who has changed our country in such meaningful ways, I said, Joe, do you remember the first time you came to speak at NYU? Do you remember the Q&A? And I didn't even have to finish the sentence. He said, oh, yes, I remember what happened. I said, what happened after that? I'm really curious. He said, I looked at myself. I noticed something I had never noticed before. He said, I think this work of being a good person is hard. And I said to myself, McNeil, it's time to grow up. My god, this man for whom museums have been built. If you've been to the Museum of American History, there's a whole wing about the Greensboro Four. This man who has done so much, if he can keep growing, if he can keep noticing, if he can have a growth mindset, 
then I think I can too. Thank you so much.